retrofit strategy, structural modeling with displacement demand and soil structure interaction. A brief overview of the topics to be discussed today, seismic design, will cover the existing bridge, many of the geometric uh, challenges that the structure contains. Also going to talk about the evolving code that involves the ASHTO and the differences between the 17th and LRFG 4th editions as well as some of the seismic criteria, modeling assumptions, and again, some of the special considerations that apply to the structure. The structure's undergone two widenings, uh, one on each side of the original. We're also going to look at soil structure interaction, dealing with soil springs, whether it be linear and nonlinear, and also addressing the stiffness matrix for the foundation. We're going to look at the uh, coupled and the uncoupled matrix as well also cover testing and modeling and go over some of the results from an actual pushover analysis performed in SAP. First of all, a quick look at the seismic design. In 1927 the UBC came out with a static lateral load to be applied to bridge structures. This evolved into a 1967 Caltrans which was later adopted by ASHTO. They studied the dynamic effects on the bridge structure. The existing structure under consideration today was designed in the early 1960s. It's located in a substantial seismic zone in the state of Washington and construction took place in 1965. From the time of design and construction in the 1960s, bridge design codes have undergone many changes. For example, some of the evolutions in the code for force-based design, the ASHTO 17th edition standard specification for highway bridges was published in 2002. The method specified in the ASHTO 17th edition was based on a force-based design or applying an equivalent lateral load based on the acceleration of the seismic mass. Since publication in 2002, the design has shifted more towards a displacement-based design or in order to ensure ductility in a structure, it has to be able to withstand a certain seismic displacement demand. Since that time, ASHTO has come out with the fourth edition of the LRFD bridge design specifications published in 2007. The two codes are similar in the way that they determine the elastic seismic demand through a response spectrum analysis. However, depending on the site conditions, the two are a little bit different when it comes to the ductility and displacement demand of the structure. The model assumptions in this project were that the bridge was designed and constructed in the 1960s and met the ASHTO code requirements in the static earthquake loading. Soil amplification characteristics and the ductility and soil structure interaction were neglected Seismic design criteria for the retrofitted structure include a, an event with a 7% chance of exceedance in 50 years. That comes out to return period of about 1,000 years. The given soil site class was a class D, and the short coefficient was 0 0.935 and the one second coefficient of 0 0.311. A peak ground accel acceleration was calculated at 1.08 G. As mentioned earlier, there are some special considerations for the structure. The original northbound bridge was constructed in 1965. Since that time, there have been two widening additions. There's been one on each side of the original structure. An additional challenge to the soil structure interaction problem is that the original boring logs indicate that there were several layers of peat around the bridge piers. This picture shows an original view of the bridge taken at Pier 2. You can see a cross section of the deck as well as two columns of cap beam and spread footings underneath. The bold portion on the left of this next slide shows the addition, the first addition to the bridge in the early 1990s. It shows a three foot diameter column going into a five foot drilled shaft. The final widening of the structure took place in the late 1990s. A three foot diameter column was used extending into a six foot drilled shaft. While the last three views have been of the northbound structure, this is a view of the southbound structure. It underwent one widening sequence with three foot diameter columns extending into five foot drilled shafts. Soil structure interaction was the main focus of the analysis. There were several influences and modeling techniques that were put to use. The fundamental period of the structure ultimately is affected by the soil structure interaction. There are different types of damping that can take place. One's hysteretic and that actually takes place when there's a plastic hinge that forms in the column above the footing and the other is radiation damping, similar to the drop of water and the propagating waves progressively moving away from the original drop. 
With the influence methods in mind, the modeling techniques investigated were the finite element model and an equivalent soil spring model. The finite element model is based on meshing a 2D and 3D objects for an analysis. Some of the problems with the finite element model is that it can be difficult and very time consuming and you have to have the appropriate meshing and interpolation functions in order to get accurate results. Similarly, by generating a soil spring stiffness matrix, you have the option of a linear versus a nonlinear spring. You can also use a couple versus an uncoupled stiffness matrix. For starters, a nonlinear stiffness matrix must be based on laboratory testing. Some of the advantages that come with using a nonlinear stiffness matrix are you have greater accuracy in predicting the soil structure interaction. You can develop a stiffness that is time dependent rather than strictly linear elastic. Although it may produce greater accuracy, some of the disadvantages are that it requires extensive testing in order to determine the soil properties and nonlinear characteristics. Through their research and laboratory development, Bobet and Smith Pardo developed an actual model of the nonlinear soil characteristics. As you can see in the 2x2 two two stiffness matrix, the stiffness function is integrated based on the chosen shape functions and the coupled terms can be seen in the lower left and upper right corners of the matrix. And similar to Bobet and Smith Pardo's work, the following matrices represent an uncoupled and a coupled stiffness matrix. K sub s has all diagonal terms representing the stiffness of each of six degrees of freedom. K s coupled has the diagonal terms as well as the coupled terms. The effects of the coupled stiffness matrix may be most easily described in this figure. There are actually moment-induced shears and shear-induced moments depending on the degree of fixity between the footing and the column and the pile heads themselves. Looking at the global coordinate system in the lower right corner of this figure, you can see that a displacement in the x direction will produce a rotation about the y axis. Accounting for these off-diagonal terms in the coupled stiffness matrix becomes important as the connection between the pile head and basic column becomes more of a fixed condition. Benefits of the uncoupled stiffness matrix are that it is easy to use and construct and it contains only diagonal elements in the 6x6 matrix, uh, one term for each degree of freedom. There is a lot of simplicity in the calculations whereas in the coupled stiffness matrix it's difficult to construct, it requires some iteration and it also contains the elements that are off diagonal in the 6x6 matrix and accounts for the additional shear and additional moment due to displacements and rotations. The following is an example from an MSEER and Federal Highway Administration publication called the Seismic Retrofitting Manual for Highway Structures, Part 1 Bridges. Here's an example of a linear uncoupled matrix with all the translational degrees of freedom, including a longitudinal and lateral rotation. The approximate equations involve using Poisson's ratio, a soil shear modulus, and the plan view length and plan view width of the footing itself. This is an extruded ute of the bridge used in the analysis. Abutment 1 is on the left, followed by Pier 2, Pier 3, and Abutment 4 on the right. Note that the bottom of the center two columns on Pier 2 and Pier 3 have three translational springs and three rotational springs as well. Plastic hinge locations were defined as by the shaded areas at the bottom of each column and at the top of each column. The linear elastic seismic demand on the structure was determined through a response spectrum analysis. The transverse displacement capacity at Pier 2 was determined through a pushover analysis. This table summarizes the uncoupled versus the coupled stiffness matrices used in the model. Three stiffnesses were used, a base model, an FHWA method, and a washed out method. Generally, the springs in the base model were much stiffer than the FHWA and the washed out method. Focusing on the results between the FHWA and washed out methods, the structural period for the uncoupled versus the coupled stiffness matrices were nearly identical as well as the elastic seismic demand. The difference came in the pushover analysis. The uncoupled model with all diagonal terms had a higher pushover capacity than did the coupled model. An explanation for the coupled model having less displacement capacity than the uncoupled model is that the moment induced shears and shear induced moments were taken into account and added to the plastic section properties that were already calculated. This in turn caused an earlier failure of the column members and a hinge to form sooner than the uncoupled spring model. In conclusion, using an uncoupled spring stiffness matrix is straightforward and you can use standard laboratory tests to determine the soil properties. Typically it yields reasonable results, however it can overestimate the uh, elastic seismic demand on a structure. Using the coupled spring matrix it's more complex, however it does produce more accurate results but remains difficult to develop.